Chapters of Life by Tuesday Lobsang Grandpa Read for you by Blue Friend in beautiful B.C. Chapter 7 End of a Chapter The dog whined disconsolately, ears drooping mournfully down towards the ground, whined and whined again, with his tail hanging listlessly between his legs. A sudden shiver of apprehension twitched his body and caused him gloomily to give utterance to a short, sharp bark. The leaves of the trees rustled as if in sympathy as the dog cowered at the door. For a moment he became alert, vibrant with suppressed energy, as he listened to some distant sound, then slumped again in disappointed misery. On an impulse he leaped up and scrabbled at the door, tearing great gouges in the woodwork. Throwing his head back he gave voice to wolf-like shrieks and yells. Soft padding footsteps sounded round the corner of the house, and an old voice said, Bruno, Bruno, be quiet, will you? You cannot go in, the master's very ill. Then, as an afterthought, he added, Here, come with me. I'll tie you up in the potting shed, where you'll be out of the way. The old gardener fumbled in his pockets and produced a length of binder twine. Passing one end through the dog's collar, he led him off to a distant clump of trees. Dispiritedly, the dog followed, his head down and whining. "'What's wrong, George?' asked a feminine voice from a kitchen window. "'Ah, the dog knows what's happening, that's what's wrong,' replied George, not pausing to say more. The woman turned to some unseen companion and muttered, "'Well, I never did. It just shows you that dumb animals know what's going on. That's what I say.' Sniffling, she turned her back to the window and went on with her task. In the big old house all was quiet. No clatter of crockery, no sounds of housework. Silence. Almost the silence of the grave. Like an explosion, a hidden telephone burred and burred again before it was hastily seized. The tinny rattle of the distant caller's voice and the reply in grave, masculine tones. No, sir, I'm afraid not. There is no hope. The doctor's with him now. A pause while the tinny rattle sounded again, and the rejoiner. Yes, sir, I'll give her your sympathy at the first available moment. Goodbye. From a distant door there came a gentle tinkle, short and understanding the shush-shush of hurrying footsteps, and the merest whisper of sound as the door was opened. "'Ah, yes, father,' an elderly female voice said. "'They are expecting you. I'll take you up.' Quietly the old housekeeper and the priest made their way along the carpeted corridors and up the wide staircase. The gentlest of taps on a bedroom door, and a whispered word to the priest. The door was opened silently, and a young woman appeared, came on the landing, and closed the door behind her. "'He's failing fast,' she said to the priest, "'and he asked to speak to you alone. The doctor will leave the room when you enter. Will you come with me?' She turned and led the way into the bedroom. The room was very large, and was indeed a relic of a bygone era. Heavy curtains were drawn across high windows, shutting out both sound and light. Old paintings adorned the walls, portraits of almost forgotten ancestors. By the side of old bed, a green shaded lamp threw an uncertain light around the gloomy room. A small, shrunken figure lay motionless on the wide double bed. 
a man with skin like faded parchment, wizened and feeble. By his bedside sat a doctor who rose to greet the priest. He wanted very much to see you, said the former. I will leave the room and wait outside. He's very weak, so call me if you need me. Nodding, he walked round the bed and accompanied the young woman out of the room. For a moment the priest looked about him, then placed his small case on a bedside table so that he could take out certain ritual articles. Oh, I don't need that, whispered a voice as dry as dust. Come and talk to me instead, father. The priest moved round the bed, bent and clasped the hands of the old dying man. Is your soul prepared, my son? asked the priest. That's what I want to ask you about, wheezed the ancient voice. What will happen to me? What will I see on the other side? Is there a life after this? Quietly the priest talked telling only that which his religion permitted or knew. The breath of the sufferer grew shallower and fainter. Quickly the priest hurried to the door and beckoned to the doctor. Shall I administer the last rites? he muttered. The doctor moved to the bed and lifted a wasted arm, feeling no pulse, he fitted his stethoscope to his ears and sounded the sick man's heart. Shaking his head sadly, he pulled the sheet over the dead man's face and muttered, I wonder, father, I wonder what is the other side of life. I wonder. For reasons of their own, Western religions do not tell much about death. But, after all, death is a very serious matter for all of us, just as is birth, and it seems that death should logically follow the chapter about mediums, because if no one died, mediums could not try to get in touch with them. So, we're going to discuss death, because no matter who we are, death is something that comes to all of us, just as does birth. But you know, death is actually birth. Let us see how that comes about. A baby within its mother dies to that warm, comfortable life within and reluctantly emerges into the cold, hard world without. Birth pangs are death pangs death to the old, birth into a new state. A person dies upon earth and the pains of death are the pains of birth into a different state of existence. Most times death, death itself, is quite a painless process. Actually, as death approaches, nature, in the shape of various metabolic changes, introduces a form of anesthesia into the body system. Anesthesia, which culls the actual perceptions while allowing the body reflexes to make certain movements which people think of as death pains. People actually associate pain and death, or if you prefer, death and pain, because in the majority of cases, people who are grievously ill die apparently in pain. But that pain, remember, is not the pain of death, but the pain caused by the illness itself. Perhaps there is a cancer, something affecting body organs, grasping at nerve endings or eating them away. But let us remember that this pain is the pain of the illness, the pain of the complaint, not death itself. Death, the actual state of transition from this world to the next, the actual state of leaving this physical body, is a painless 
process because of the anesthetical properties which come to most bodies at the moment of death. Some of us know what it is to die and to remember everything and to come back still remembering. In the process of dying, we have a body which is ailing. Functions are failing. But remember this, the functions are failing. That means the ability to perceive or apperceive or comprehend pain, impulses, is failing also. We know that people sometimes give an impression of pain at dying, but this again is an illusion. The dying body is a body which has usually, except in the case of accident, reached the end of its endurance. It can go no more. The mechanism is failing. There is no longer the ability for metabolic processes to renew failing organisms. Eventually, the heart stops. The breathing stops. Clinically, a person is dead when no breath condenses on a mirror held before the lips. Clinically and legally, a person is dead when there is no longer a pulse or a heartbeat. People do not die on the instant, however. After the heart has ceased to beat and after the lungs have ceased to pump, the brain is the next to die. The brain cannot live long without its precious supply of oxygen, but even the brain does not die instantly. It takes minutes. There have been absolutely authenticated cases where people have been beheaded and the head, severed from the body, has been held up for public inspection. The lips have continued to move and a lip reader can distinguish the words being formed. Obviously, only a lip reader can interpret what is being said because there can be no speech when the neck has been cut and the supply of air from the lungs terminated. It is the air supply going past the vocal cords which makes the sound. After the brain has died, after the brain is no longer capable of functioning through this lack of oxygen, the rest of the body dies slowly. Various organs die throughout a day or so. At the end of three days, the body is just a lump of decomposing protoplasm. But the body does not matter. It is the immortal soul that matters, the over-self. But let us go back to the instant of clinical death. The body, in this case, is lying on a bed. The breathing has stopped. A clairvoyant who is present can see a cloud, like a faint mist, forming above the body. It streams from the body, usually from the navel, although various people have various outlets for the silver cord. Gradually, this cloud coalesces and becomes denser. Its molecules are less dispersed. Gradually, a shadowy f shape forms above the body. As the process of death advances, the shape becomes more and more that of the body. Eventually, as more organs fail, the cloud gets thicker and larger, taking at last the exact shape of the body above which it floats. The cord, which we call the silver cord, connects the physical body and the astral body, for the cloud is in fact the astral body. Gradually this cord thins until at the end it withers, fades away and parts. Only then is the body really dead. Only then has the real person flown off to another life, to another stage of evolution. Once that misty figure has gone, 
It does not matter at all what happens to the fleshy envelope. It can be cremated or buried, it doesn't matter which. It is perhaps opportune to digress here for a moment to issue what may be construed as a warning because so many people make it difficult indeed for the newly dead to continue to live. When a person has died, that person should be left untouched for two or three days if possible. It is definitely harmful to take that dead body and prop it up in a casket in some funeral home and have a lot of well-meaning people go and mutter all sorts of wonderful tributes, which, most times, they don't mean. Until the silver cord be severed and the golden bowl be shattered, the astral form, floating, can pick up the thoughts of those who are making comments at its passing. Further, if a body be cremated in less than three days, there is often intense pain caused to the astral figure. And the pain, curiously enough, is not the pain of hot fire, but of intense cold. So if you value those who have gone on before, and if you will do as you would be done by, you will, whenever possible, ensure that a person who has died has three clear days in which to sever and disassociate completely from the physical body. But we have got to the stage where the spirit or astral form has left the body. The spirit has gone on where it meets other spirits and, of course, to each other they are quite as solid as two people on the earth. You can only see a so-called ghost as a transparent or semi-transparent person because that ghost is at a higher vibration than a human in the flesh. But, and I'm not making a joke of this, two ghosts are two solid people to each other, just as two ordinary humans in the flesh. If one has a person of a different dimension, then they might possibly see humans in the flesh as ghosts. Because, think of this, a two-dimensional object casts a one-dimensional shadow. A three-dimensional object casts a two-dimensional shadow. But a four-dimensional object, that fourth dimension again, casts a three-dimensional shadow. And how do you know that you, to a fourth-dimensional person, are not just a semi-transparent shadow? The spirit, then, has left the body and gone on. And if it is an evolved spirit, that is, if it is aware of life after death, then it can be assisted in going to what is known as the Hall of Memories, where all the incidents of the past life are seen, where all mistakes are perceived and appreciated. This, of course, according to some religions, is the Day of Judgment or the Judgment Hall. But according to our religion, man judges himself, and there is no sterner judge than man judging himself. Unfortunately, it frequently happens that a person dies and he does not believe in an afterlife. In that case, he drifts about for some time as if in the dark, as if in some stupendous cloying black fog. He drifts about feeling more and more miserable until, at last, he realizes that he is in some form of existence after all. Then, perhaps, some early teaching will come to his aid. He may have gone to Sunday school. He may be a Christian, a Muslim. It doesn't matter what it is, so long as he has some basic training, so long as he has some preconceived idea about things. He can be helped. 
Suppose a person was brought up to some branch of the Christian faith. Then he may have thought forms of heaven and angels and all that sort of thing. But of course, if he was brought up in certain parts of the East, he will think of a different type of heaven, where all the pleasures of the flesh, which he couldn't satisfy while alive, or rather couldn't satisfy while he was in a fleshy body, are his for the asking. So our man, who just had a smattering of religion, goes on, for a time, in an imaginary world, peopled by thought forms which he himself has created. Thought forms of angels, or thought forms of beautiful maidens, depending on which part of the world he came from. It all goes on for an indefinite time, until, at last, he begins to perceive various fallacies, various errors, in the surroundings. He might, for example, find that the angel's wings are molting, or, if an Easterner, he may find that certain of the beautiful maidens are not so completely beautiful as he thought. The Christian may come to the conclusion that this is not much of a heaven where people wear brass halos, because people couldn't be sitting on a cloud playing harps all the time, dressed in their best night shirts. So doubt creeps in. Doubt of the thought forms. Doubt of the reality of that which is being seen. But let us take the other side. The fellow wasn't a very good man. He thinks of hell. He gets all sorts of pains and aches because he has an image of an old Satan prodding him in various vital spots. He has thought of fire, brimstone, sulfur, and all those ingredients which would be of more use in a pharmaceutical laboratory. Again, doubt creeps in. What is the purpose of all this pain? How can he be prodded so thoroughly when there is no blood? How can he have his bones broken every few minutes or so? Gradually, the doubts strengthen. Gradually, his spiritual mind becomes accessible to what we might term social workers of the spirit world. At last, when he is amenable to assistance, they take him in hand. They clear away all the theatrical props which the man's imagination has built. They let him see the true reality. They let him see that the other side of death is a far, far better place than is this side, the earth side. Let us digress once more. This is becoming a habit, but let us digress. Let us imagine a man in a radio studio facing a microphone. He does some particular sound. Ah! Well, that ah leaves him, enters the microphone as a vibration, becomes translated into an electrical current, and travels along a very devious path. Eventually, it goes through much apparatus and becomes a very much higher frequency version of ah. In the same way, a body upon earth is the low vibration of a voice. The spirit or soul or over-self or atman or whatever you want to call it can be represented as being akin to the radio frequency of the ah. Do you follow what I'm talking about? It is a rather difficult concept to put over without using Sanskrit terms or going into Buddhist philosophy, but we don't want to do anything like that yet. Let us deal with matter-of-fact things in matter-of-fact terms. Death is a very matter-of-fact affair. We all go through it. 
time after time until at last we are free of the pains and tribulations of being born and dying to earth. But remember, even when we advance to higher planes and to different forms of existence, we still have birth and dying with which to contend. But the higher we go, the more painless and the more pleasurable are these two stages in our existence. Well, let us get back to this poor fellow who we left in the spirit world. He's probably tired of waiting for us. But the spirit world, remember, or the astral stage, is an intermediate stage. Some religions relate it to paradise. There is the earth plane, paradise, and eventually heaven, provided the victim doesn't get sent to hell first. Our man is in the spirit world to see what sort of a mess he's made of his life. Did he leave undone those things which he should have done? Did he do those things which he should not have done? If he's a normal human, the answer is yes on both counts. So he goes into the Hall of Memories to see what he did in past lives. How did he fail to learn things which he should have learned? And then, when he sees his faults and he also sees his successes, he discusses with special guides, who are not Red Indians, by the way, or ancient Chinese with long beards, but very special guides of his own type of person, own basic beliefs, etc. People who know the problems with which he's confronted, they know what he has been through. They know how they acted in similar circumstances. They are a bit more evolved, a bit more trained. They can see what this man has to learn in much the same way as a careers guidance counselor can tell a person how to get a certain qualification so that he can later try for a specific appointment. After this meeting, conditions and circumstances are picked so that the person can come back to earth into the body of a small baby, perhaps as a male or perhaps as a female. It might disconcert some of you, but people come to this earth as male and then as female. It all depends on which is most applicable to the type of lesson that has to be learned. It doesn't mean that because you are a very male male right now, or an extremely feminine female, you will be the same in the next life or the life after. You might want a change of attitude. You might want to see what the other person has had to put up with. After a person has been born, time after time, they come to a state where they have to be born no more to this earth plane. But the person living the last life on earth, almost without exception, has a very hard time, a time composed of misery, suffering, poverty, misunderstanding. Anyway, misery, misunderstanding, and all kinds of suffering are, as one might say, the leavening which eventually makes a person rise up to be a good spirit instead of an indifferent human. A person living his last life upon the earth is often regarded on the earth as one of the unluckiest people ever instead of the luckiest in that they are living their last life here. All their hardships are because they are clearing up, getting ready to move out, paying debts, etc. They cannot learn through the flesh in the next life, so they have a good dose in this life. So they die, and most times, if they ever think about it, they are jolly glad. Then, back 
in the spirit world they get a good rest, for certainly they have earned it. They get a rest where they may be asleep for quite a few years, quite a few years by earth time, that is. Then they get rehabilitated, built up and all that, reconditioned, one might say. After this, they start all over again on the upward path, upward, ever upward. So the great prophet in one life, who has learned all there is to know, or thinks he has, goes on to another stage of evolution, where there are all sorts of different abilities, all sorts of varying talents which he has to master. It's like a boy who gets a hold of a bicycle. The boy learns to ride the wretched thing. Then, when he can more or less stay on without falling off, he tries a motorcycle. This is a little more complicated because he has other controls to manipulate. From the motorcycle to a car, from the car to an airplane, from an ordinary airplane to an even more difficult helicopter. All the time one is learning more and more difficult things. When we go to sleep, all of us, well, let us be accurate and say about 90% of us, do astral traveling. We go into the spirit world, into the astral world, as Christ said, In my Father's house there are many mansions. I go to prepare a way for you. In the spirit world there are many planes of existence, or many mansions. The one closest to the earth plane is the astral plane. Beyond that is what one might term the spirit world. People who have died to earth go to the spirit world, but if they want to, they can come down to the astral world to see those who are over at the end of the earth day. This is something like visiting people in a prison, but it may be a comforting thought for you because when you are in the spirit world, you may at times want to meet those with whom you were associated upon the earth. Going to a higher plane, it will comfort you even more to realize that when you are in the spirit world, not the astral, you can only meet those who are compatible with you. You cannot meet those whom you hate or those who hate you. You have people around you who are attracted to you. You can only meet those for whom you feel compatibility, kindness, consideration, or love. In the astral plane, you often meet people whom you do not particularly like. You might dislike a person intensely while on earth, and then, when you both leave your bodies at night, you go to the astral plane, and you might meet to discuss in the astral language, or in Spanish, English, German, or some other language, you might decide that you will try to patch up the differences between you. You might feel that friction has gone on long enough. So you have a discussion, you and your adversary, both in the astral plane. You decide what you can do to patch up your differences. Also, in the astral, you often discuss what you're going to do in the physical world of the earth. In the astral, you might meet Aunt Fanny, who lives in Adelaide, or some other place like that, and she will say, Oh, Maria Matilda, or some other name, I wrote you a letter such and such a time ago. You should be receiving it tomorrow when you get back to your earth body. Then, when you wake up in the morning, you have a vague idea about Aunt Fanny, or whoever it is, 
and you half-heartedly keep an eye open for the mailman to come trudging to your letter box, and then you're not too surprised that you have a letter from Aunt Fanny in Adelaide, or whoever it was that you were thinking about. Again, when one is in the astral world, one can often meet people from the spirit world who have access to some knowledge. That person will say, Now that you've done all you can down here on earth, you're going to have an argument with the bus next week, or the week after, and the bus is going to win. So you'd better get your affairs in order. You have nearly finished your task for this life. The man feels very happy while he's in the astral to think that his life on earth is nearly finished. But when he gets back to earth, he feels a bit gloomy and apprehensive and tells his wife, if he has one, that he's had such a dreadful nightmare in which he could see that she would soon be a widow. She, of course, conceals her pleasure at this, and when he goes to the office or to the store, she hurries to look in the strong box to see that that fat insurance policy is perfectly all right <laughs> with all the premiums paid up. Another way that the better evolved person can know about the future is this. He is able to travel beyond the astral plane and up into what, for want of a better term, we might call the primary spirit world. There he can consult the Akashic Record and the Record of Probabilities because it is not at all difficult to see what the probabilities of a person or a nation are. One cannot always say precisely what is going to happen to an individual, to the actual minute or even to the hour, but one can most certainly say what is going to happen to a country or to a world. Well, we certainly have dealt with death in this particular chapter, and so you should regard this as a very pleasant affair, just as do children when leaving day comes for them to finish with their school life. Let us consider for a moment how to prepare for death because just as one prepares for a wedding, one can have a much better time if one knows what is to be expected. In Tibet, several books are devoted to such things. The Tibetan Book of the Dead is one of the greatest classics in the eastern part of the world. It tells in minute detail everything that can happen to a soul leaving the body and going out on the journey to the next life. In Tibet, a lama specially clairvoyant and specially trained will sit by the side of a dying person and, by telepathy, will keep in touch with him so that even after the astral has left the physical, a conversation can be carried on. Let me state here most emphatically that no matter what the skeptical western people say eastern people know that it is possible to get messages from the so-called dead everything has been told in detail precisely what happens and precisely what it feels like the Egyptians also had a book of the dead, but in those days the priests wanted to keep a lot of power for themselves, and so they made a lot of symbolic things about the gods Horus and Osiris, and about weighing the soul against a feather. That is a very pretty story, but it does not correspond to actual facts, except that the Egyptians who were taught such things went into death with minds stuffed full of preconceived ideas, so actually saw the god Osiris 
and actually saw the judgment chamber, actually in the mind lived through all those curious things where the soul was seen to flutter like a bird and where the cat god Bubastus and others were perceived. But remember, this is just a pretty picture which has to be shattered before anyone can go on to the reality. It is like trying to live in a Walt Disney world instead of the true world. Many people have preconceived ideas which perhaps have been fostered by some particular belief or by the lack of any belief at all. They do not know what to expect when they are dying, and so they are caught up in remarkable fantasies of their own creation, or, even worse, caught in some blackness, some blankness, because of a lack of understanding. I will ask you to consider this with an open mind. It does not matter if you believe or disbelieve. Just keep an open mind and think of what I am going to say to you now. It will help you later. Give an hour or two to meditation. See the chapter on meditation later. Upon the subject of death, be prepared to accept the idea that when your time comes to leave this earth, you are going to force yourself painlessly out of this awful clay body which is cooling and feeling uncomfortable, and then you are going to gather in a cloud above the recumbent body. Then in that cloud you will send out a mental call for help from loved ones who have preceded you into the next life. You may not know much about telepathy, but that doesn't matter. When you leave this life for the greater life, you will have telepathic abilities automatically. But to help you now, let me say this. Try to remember when you are dying, that you visualize the person whom you love most on the other side. Try to actually visualize that person. Try to send out a thought that you want that person to come and meet you and help you. In much the same way, if you are going on a journey, you sometimes send a telegram saying, meet such and such a train. Then let yourself rest in peace. You will find a sensation of lightness, a sensation that you have escaped from a tight, compressing chamber. Keep an open mind. Do not scoff. Do not believe blindly, but reason it out. Practice what you are going to do when you are dying. Practice forcing yourself out of the dying body and into life. Think how similar it is to being born. Think how you are going to call on the person whom you love most for help. Then when the time comes, you will find that your passing will be painless, and anything that the flesh body is experiencing will not disturb you in the slightest. You will find that as you float there above the body, the cord anchoring you to it will thin and thin and dissipate like smoke in a breeze. You will drift off upwards into the arms of your loved ones who are there to meet you. They cannot do much for you until the cord is broken, in much the same way that you cannot shake hands with your friend while the train is still moving into the station. One of the things which puzzles many people about death is this. Why is the fear of death universal, when beyond death lies only peace and greater evolution? The answer is very easy. If people on earth knew how pleasant it was upon leaving this world, people would not stay here. 
there would be suicides, and that would be a very bad thing indeed, because suicide is wrong. So people come down to this earth with a built-in fear of death. That is a provision of nature to prevent people from committing suicide or trying to gratify their own death wish. As death actually approaches, however, all fear of that stage diminishes. So, if you are afraid to die while you are quite well, that is a normal state of affairs, because we have to be kept here just as children have to be kept in school. The children who evade going to school are not popular with the truant officer. When your time of dying comes, then, keep an open mind. Keep before your consciousness the thought that there are those very willing to help you. Remember, there's no such thing as hell. There's no such thing as eternal damnation. There is no such thing as a vengeful God who desires only your destruction. We do not believe that one should fear God. We believe instead that if God is good, God should be loved, not feared. And death also is good. It should be loved and welcomed with open arms when that time comes. But until that time comes, live according to the rule, do as you would be done by. If you are willing to devote a bit of time and patience and a whole lot of faith, then most certainly you should be able to investigate the matter of death as a seriously interested onlooker. But you will find that such investigation will entail some sacrifices. For example, you cannot go to parties, you cannot go to the movies, you cannot call in and get a quick one. Instead, you have to be as a hermit. I am a hermit, and I prefer to be a hermit, because I have all those powers about which I write and many of which can be yours if you try hard enough and with enough faith. I can do astral traveling, I can see the Akashic record, and later in this particular chapter I am going to deal with prophecy. A great amount can be done by meditation and by concentration. For this, Obviously, one has to be a hermit. Hermits, monks, lamas, call them what you will, are solitary people withdrawn from the ordinary circle of social life, withdrawn at their own choice, so that they may concentrate, meditate, and go forth in astral travel. This astral travel business is very, very real. It is a fact, but it is as simple as breathing. The trouble is that you cannot take any luggage with you. It is useless to travel across the ocean to another country and think that you will stay for the weekend with friends. The difficulty is that your friends, unless they are of the same stage, may not be able to see you. The trouble is that you can neither take anything with you, nor can you bring anything back that is material or solid. One very interesting thing is in the astral one can see the Akashic record, provided one is the f of the uh, fortunate few who have what I might call special permission. Let me say here and now that many of those people who pretend to go into the astral world and consult your Akashic record are fakes, and in fact swindlers. They take your money, usually around fifty dollars, but they are quite unable to do what they claim to do. 
So if anyone tells you that he's going to go into the astral world and bring back your Akashic record for 50 bucks, hang on to your $50. It is a fortunate provision that not everyone can see the Akashic record because think what a terrible weapon it would be in the hands of blackmailers or criminals. Indiscriminate use of the Akashic record would cause untold harm. Thus it is that only those who are of pure intention can gain access to the Akashic record. What is this Akashic record? It is like a cinematograph film. For example, you have some great epic of the silver screen, and if you know how, you can get to any particular part of the film, and you can see any particular part at will. In much the same way, everything that has happened in the past is on record. Look at it this way. Let us assume something that is only possible in the astral. Assume that in the physical we could travel instantaneously to a far, far distant planet thousands of light years away. Then supposing we had an instrument which would enable you to see what was happening on Earth. You would not, of course, see Earth as it is now, but you would see Earth as it was years ago, because light has a speed. Everything you see is after the thing happened. The speed of light is very, very fast, relatively speaking. But let us consider sound instead. You see that man down there half a mile away? He has an axe in his hand. He's chopping wood with great energy. You see the axe hit the wood, and then, an appreciable time after, you hear the sound. Again, a supersonic jet plane screams across the sky. You look up to where the sound appears to be coming from, but by that time the plane is about five miles or so ahead of the sound that you are hearing. The speed of sound is slow compared to the speed of light, and light, remember, is near enough sight. Supposing you have the ability to go instantly out into space and stop at any particular instant and see clearly the light picture which is arriving from Earth. Go out a few years, a few light years that is, you know, then you will see, what shall we say? We might see Napoleon marching away to Moscow, or we might see General Eisenhower practicing his golf. But go a bit farther, and you would see much of the country of the United States covered with bushes, with wigwams and Indians, and perhaps here and there a few of the famed covered wagons. Go farther back, go back a thousand years or two thousand years, go back into the pages of history. You would find that history is very different from that which is written in the history books. History is written to fit the politics of the time, to fit the mood of the country and the beliefs of the country. A journey into the Akashic would show you the truth. As an illustration, let us quote Francis Drake, the great hero of England. What is it to be? Sir Francis Drake, the great hero of England, or as the Spanish people view him, Francis Drake the pirate, the buccaneer, the man who tried to ruin the Spanish trade. Look at the Spanish Inquisition. What was the truth of it? Were the Inquisitors saints? Or was it similar to Belsen and other concentration camps in Germany? The Akashic Record will tell you. But the Akashic Record, you know, is not just what happened in the past. You can also see the great probabilities for the future. 
Here, in this particular time, we are like a man alone on a winding road, a road with many obstacles beyond which he cannot see. But put that man up in a helicopter and he can see farther. He can see past the obstacles. He can see the road ahead. And so it is with the Akashic Record. You can see the probabilities which lie ahead. Now, this does not mean that all the future is predestined. The main events are, yes, as an example, let me say, you know that there will be a tomorrow, and a day after tomorrow, and a week after that. You can safely forecast that. But you cannot safely forecast the minor, minute details. You can say that a bus will go from here to some distant point. The timetable tells you that it will leave at such and such a time, and that it will arrive at intermediate stations at such and such a time, and eventually arrive at the destination at the prearranged time. You have no fear that the bus or train will fail to arrive. In other words, you are forecasting what will happen. You are forecasting the future of that bus. There is a very complicated theory, which is actually a very true theory, about parallel universes, and to the effect that everything has already happened, and that we are living in a different time continuum. However, we do not propose to go into that here. Instead, let it be stated that the seers of old could see into the future. The seers of the present can do so also. Now I'm going to give you an illustration of this. This is something which happened to me, which happened under full control. I went into a trance and this is what I saw. I saw first a probability that a war would be starting. Now, looking back, I can say that, yes, that was so. That was the war which started in Vietnam after the French withdrew, after the Foreign Legion was disbanded. But that was proved to be correct. Other things are, in the future, Italy will be conquered by communism. For the time being, the Christian religion will be lost and the Vatican will be closed. Cardinals and bishops will be killed. Communism will seep through Europe. It will not be the communism which we know at the present time. It will be modified somewhat. The original communism of Russia was a much rougher, tougher affair than it is now, more like the Chinese communism. England and the United States will eventually amalgamate for protection, and England will come under the direction of the United States, and will in fact have an American as its governor, which is quite an amusing thought when one thinks that people went from England to found America, and now the Americans are going to go back and rediscover England. Eventually, the surface of the earth will crack. If you have read the reports of the International Geophysical Year, you will know that there are great areas of stress beneath the ocean, areas where alterations are taking place. Already the seabeds are rising. Lost continents, which are now the seabed, will rise and form new lands present lands will sink, and the world will, for a time, be in panic and turmoil. New York will be leveled to the ground, and eventually shall sink beneath the waters of the Atlantic. Los Angeles and San Francisco, Seattle and Vancouver on the Pacific coast, will be leveled to the ground, and then shall sink beneath the rising Pacific. 
Most of the coastline will be inundated. The whole land will change. From over Alaska will come rockets with bombs from communist Russia. Great devastation will be caused in the United States and Canada. Of course, through retaliatory methods of these countries, great devastation will also be caused in Russia. But on the North American continent, a few survivors will cluster on top of the Rocky Mountains, enough to repopulate the continent later. In Canada, the Great Lakes, which are now freshwater lakes, shall reverse the direction of their flow through the tipping of the Earth's axis, so that the sea shall flow from Quebec to Montreal, from Montreal to Buffalo, Buffalo to Detroit, and the water shall pile up at Chicago and flood the city and flood the land and cut for itself a salt waterway into the Mississippi. The rushing waters, made into a raging torrent by the tipping of the world's axis, will soon erode away a lot of the land, so that there a new island is formed. All that which is divided by the water and facing the sea shall be a new land. In Europe, the bed of the Mediterranean shall rise and become high land, and there shall be opened great tombs, part of sunken Egypt and part of the land sunk years before. The whole of the South American continent shall be disturbed by earthquakes. The Falkland Islands shall be islands no longer but shall unite as a high land with the lower third of Argentina. At about the lower third of Argentina, a great rift shall appear, so that there is access from the Pacific to the Atlantic through a gap which shall be no wider than the gap between the Mediterranean and Gibraltar. Under the change of weight distribution, the earth shall tilt even more, and the seasons will change, the poles will melt, and much land will become available in these areas, together with wondrous ores and many new resources. Japan and Korea and part of the Chinese coast will sink beneath the waters, but other lands shall emerge from the seas. The Russians will have moved great satellites into space. Soon the Chinese will get into space also, for they will have seized scientists from the United States who fled from the floods and destruction. The year 2000 will see great events in space, not always for peace, for there shall be great rivalry between the two branches of communism, the Russians and the Chinese. In the year 2004, there will be a tremendous war between China and Russia in space. On earth people will huddle in deep shelters, and many shall be saved. More land shall sink, and more shall rise. One part of this prophecy gave me so much cause for thought, I wondered if I should be discreetly silent and not mention it. But what does it matter? Let us tell the truth. Let us, as we've gone so far, so go a little farther. In the year 2008 or so, the Russians and the Chinese will settle their differences under the stimulus of a much greater thing. From far out in space, from beyond this whole system, will come people, humans, who will come here and want to settle on this earth. The humans already here will be frightfully cross about it all, and they will look upon their unwanted guests with a jaundiced eye. 
For a time, there will be considerable commotion. However, eventually, common sense and reason will prevail. The people from outer space will demonstrate peaceful intentions, and that is a thing sadly lacking on this earth. In time, the people from outer space shall settle down with the people who are native to this earth. They will intermarry. All races will intermarry, so that at last there shall only be one race, and it shall be known as the race of tan, because the mixture of all colors, white, black, yellow, and brown, will result in a very pleasant tan shade. At this stage in the evolution of earth, it shall be the golden age, the age of peace, the age of tranquility and of high occult knowledge. It shall be an age when man, whether terrestrial or extraterrestrial, shall get along harmoniously. The future beyond that? Yes, that's clear also. But let us be content with this first episode because it is, in fact, a true episode. Do you laugh? Are you cynical? Skeptical? Well, you're entitled to your opinion, as I'm entitled to my knowledge. If you had my knowledge, you would not be listening to me now, and you would not be laughing. A very short time ago it was stated that man would never send a message across the Atlantic by radio. And then it was said, man would never fly the Atlantic in an airplane. It was stated that no one could possibly go faster than the speed of sound because people would die. It was also reported that man would not be able to go into space because the heat generated by the speed would burn him up. Man has gone into space, and woman also. Things which are utterly impossible today are commonplace tomorrow. Now we bounce television programs off an artificial satellite. Now we bounce radio messages off the moon, Mars, and Venus. How can you say that my prophecy is not true? It is a sad thing that people condemn that which they do not understand. It is a sad thing that if people cannot do this or that or something else, then they are inclined to say, Oh, but that's impossible, quite impossible. Such things are beyond human knowledge. This, of course, is nonsense, because when one can see the Akashic record of everything that has happened, one can also see the record of probabilities. And if you wonder what the record of probabilities is, let me give you a simple illustration. Probabilities are those things which you expect to happen. You expect that tomorrow or the day after and for years after that, ships will steam upon the seas, planes will fly across the skies, and cars will go spewing noxious fumes throughout the countryside. You really expect that will happen, because it is so probable. The future of a race or country can be forecast with the highest degree of accuracy, and the record of probabilities indicates what all that will be. Here you have had an insight into what will happen, but there are other things, little incidents which point the way. Do you want some more? All right. In years to come, England will be a state of the United States in much the same way as Hawaii and Alaska are states of the United States. Eventually, England will be controlled by and from the United States. And eventually, England will subscribe to the federal laws of the United States. 
Canada will be one of the leading countries of the world in centuries to come. Canada and Brazil. Brazil at present is in decline, but Brazil shall rise and shall be perhaps the second greatest country of the world. It shall in fact become High Brazil once again. France and Russia will unite in years to come to really squash Germany. France and Russia both feel menaced by Germany, and they will unite forces to end that threat, and the German race will be scattered among nations in the same manner as Jews are now scattered among the other nations. The United States and Russia will combine to defeat China. The new China, which poses a threat to civilization everywhere, and so the bear and the eagle shall unite to defeat the dragon, and not until the dragon is defeated shall there be any enduring peace. Those of you who are astrologically inclined will remember that on February the 5th, 1962, 16 degrees covered the Sun the Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn during an eclipse at that time. The next time that will happen will be on May 5th of the year 2000. And shortly before that time, Halley's Comet will return in April 1986. All these configurations will lead to momentous occurrences throughout the world. It will be the opening of a new age, the time when hope flourishes again, like the gentle spring flowers which revive and bloom anew when the winter snows give way to sunshine. And as the spring flowers are renewed by the seasons, and the renaissance which comes about every year, so shall man. Man's hopes and spiritual aspirations become renewed after the year 2000. It might be as well here to say something about the changing climate of this world, because almost everyone in the world must have noticed great changes. The climate also is a worthy subject of prediction. In the years to come, there will be many earthquakes. Land will rise and land will fall, and much land will become water. Out in the Pacific, there is a great fault extending thousands of miles. It is a crack in the Earth's surface, and if many more nations start letting off many more atom bombs, or worse, the crack will open a little and shift a lot and then there will be a whole series of earthquakes and floods. For hundreds of years, it has been possible to more or less predict the weather. One could consult charts kept at meteorological offices, and these charts would indicate that the temperature of, say, Canada, normally would fall between such and such limits at such and such time, while, for example, in Buenos Aires, there were different limits of rise and fall. It was possible to predict the weather in Moscow, or Timbuktu, or anywhere, by consulting records which indicated what the average temperature should be at other equivalent times for many, many years past. We have known what would happen during each season. We have known if the summer was going to be hotter than winter, and what the limits of cold were going to be, and what the limits of heat were going to be. But all of this is changing, and changing rapidly, through a whole conglomeration of causes, most of them man-made. Have you noticed? that quite recently there have been increasing reports of freak weather. In the United States, 
there have been absolutely abnormally cold winters. In Georgia, the weather has been quite a lot below zero. Arizona, that too, has had a great deal of cold, at times 40 degrees below. I have had letters from friends in Canada and the United States, and I get reports of freak weather, stunning cold. Then a week later, almost a heat wave. I had a report the other day from Niagara Falls, Canada. The weather was extremely hot, sweltering hot, and then it became frightfully cold. In Detroit, USA, the weather has been stunningly cold. Then suddenly it turned hot. In the North and East United States, there has been dryness. In fact, April of this year was the driest ever recorded on the United States weather stations. There was no water for the plants. No irrigation system worked. Plants withered in the parched ground. I don't know how many of you have been to the United States, but in Montana, not so far from the Canadian border, there is a big national park, and in that park there is a glacier. In fact, there are several, but some have completely melted, and others are greatly diminished. Certain areas of the United States and Canada depend quite a lot on ski programs, programs calling for snow and ice. Well, there has been no snow or ice, and so these people, depending on such climatic conditions, have been ruined. In the Midwest, there have been tornadoes, tremendous tornadoes, the number and speed and ferocity of tornadoes has been increasing. Quite recently, there have been more than 800 tornadoes a year in mid-United States. But let us leave the United States. There are other parts of the world. I get mail from all over the world, and it does not need mail but newspapers to bring in information about the weather. In England, there has been absolute freak weather, the coldest on record. And in England, they have had the worst blizzard ever. Traffic was at a standstill. People were short of food and were freezing. Cattle died through exposure and through starvation. In the Mediterranean, weather has been completely freak. Abnormally cold, for instance, and about a meter in depth of snow in Sicily, which advertises as sunny Sicily. Well, they might have had sunshine, but they certainly had Syrian cold as well. It is all freak weather. The climate of the world is changing. In Rome, there was ice on the river Tiber, there was ice, ice for the first time in 500 years. One associates Rome, Italy, with warmth, with a kind, benevolent climate, not with ice on the Tiber River, on which people could skate. And another part of the world, Japan, they've had the roughest winter in living history. Storms, crop failures, they've had everything bad. In Russia, on the other hand, the climate seems to have been getting milder. Siberia is less frigid, and of course with all these changes in climatic conditions, more changes are caused. For if we heat an area of land, the air above it rises and forms cumulus clouds. It may be that so many atom bombs have obscured the direct radiation of the sun to earth and back into space, that that has altered zones of temperature throughout the world. Thus it is, as has been predicted, that in the not too distant future things are going to change on this earth. 
Have you ever thought of this? If the ice at the North Pole and South Pole melted, the water level all around the world would rise by at least 600 feet. Think, even if some of the ice on the coast of Russia were to melt, the resulting flood could inundate New York or Montevideo. In fact, it would not take too many feet of water to completely flood Uruguay. But, in case Uruguayans want to rush out and get water wings and bathing suits, let me say this. According to predictions, that part of the world will rise, so that, instead of being flooded, it will be quite a long way above water level. New York will sink beneath the waves, so it is predicted, and down near the end of Argentina, a rift will be caused, dividing the tail of Argentina from the body. So there will be, in effect, an island there, and a quicker passage through to the Pacific Ocean. That in itself will cause a bit of commotion, because the Pacific is saltier than the Atlantic, and so we have more or less a paradox. The Pacific water will be warmer but heavier, and so it will sink in the colder waters of the Atlantic, because the Atlantic is not so salty, and is therefore lighter. The Russians are busy altering the weather to their own advantage by tampering with the Gulf Stream, which causes warm water, which normally should go to Europe, to flow along the sides of Siberia, so that Siberia is becoming thawed out and will become the far land of Russia. But in the swing of balance, England could have another ice age, and ice could sweep across quite a lot of Europe. Normally, the earth is surrounded by layers of air, some of them traveling as air currents in the same way as there are water currents. Normally, the amount of cosmic rays entering and striking the earth is fairly constant, but now, because of the meddling with the upper atmosphere by rockets traversing and bombs going off, the outer atmosphere's jet streams have been disturbed and diverted. Thus, there are temperature inversions so that hot air perhaps cannot rise and whole lands become parched through lack of rain and through excess of heat. Temperature zones throughout the world are changing, mainly for the worse, and unless mankind rises up to control those who desire war, then mankind is going to have a pretty sorry time before they have a better time. However, we are now in the age of Kali, the age of pain, suffering, and despair. Soon will come the dawn when man can again hope and know that he is progressing towards greater things, greater happiness, greater spirituality, and greater faith in his fellow men. End of chapter 7